Realms of the Phase 6, Woven from Dreams, written by Avril Sabine. Dedication. For my daughter, the inspiration for this story. Book description. Elsie has been losing things in her sleep for as long as she can remember. Things she doesn't really want. Everyone has always told her she must lose them some other way. That no one loses things in their sleep. But when her boyfriend disappears, after she falls asleep next to him, she needs to figure out what's going on. And discover who the green-eyed fae is that she sees in her dreams. The one who keeps telling her she's dreaming. Chapter 1 Elsie struggled to keep her eyes open, aware of Jackson lying on the lounge room floor beside her, cushions from the couch beneath their heads. She kept her gaze firmly on the television screen, having no idea what had happened in the movie. Had Jackson moved closer to her? Why couldn't she find the words to break things off? Marinda had said two more weeks wouldn't hurt. To finish things at the end of the June to July school holidays. She couldn't last that long. The previous night was a perfect example of why. Jackson's mum had 20 acres with an old caravan on it, northwest of Brisbane, which she and her sister had inherited when their father had passed away the previous year. Neither of them could decide what to do with it, so it sat there, empty. The perfect place for parties during school holidays. No neighbours to complain and no parents to keep an eye on what they were up to. Which had been a problem, since Jackson had wanted to be up to a little bit more than she'd been interested in. Not that he'd pressured her or anything. She just hated to destroy the hopeful expression he'd had. It seemed to be a habit of hers lately when it came to him, and she always felt so terrible that she couldn't feel for him, the way he obviously felt for her. Yet she also didn't want to hurt him when she ended things, and she had no idea how to go about that. She felt a light tug on her hair. She didn't need to turn her head to know he was wrapping the long, dark blonde strands around one of his fingers. He did it so often, fascinated by her hair that was a couple of shades darker than his own closely cropped hair. She allowed her eyes to close, wondering if ignoring him would work. The gentle tugging continued. She let a silent sigh escape. After the movie. No matter how difficult it would be, she would end things with him after the movie. It wasn't fair to either of them to let things continue as they were. It felt like her life was on hold while she waited for the right moment and the correct words to end things between them. Words that wouldn't hurt him. She was beginning to think they didn't exist. Keeping her eyes closed, she tried to think of an opening sentence. What did you say to someone when there was nothing really wrong with them, other than they bored you? The old, it's not you, it's me, was overdone. No one believed that line these days. So what could she say? He was nice. Although sometimes he was a little too nice to people who didn't deserve it. Friendly. Which could be a bad thing when you were in a hurry, and his many friends kept waylaying him. He had a good sense of humor and certainly more than his fair share of looks. About her only complaint was the stupid way his mum had spelt his name. Another sigh escaped, this one a little louder than the first. She stilled when his fingers stopped tugging on the strands of her hair. Had he heard her sigh? She remained perfectly still, her breathing slow and steady. Tiredness tugged at her and she tried to open her eyes. A young man leaned over her. It took her a few seconds to realize she was dreaming, her surroundings out of focus, her gaze fixed on the young man. His long black hair was drawn back from his face to show the tips of his ears were pointed, his green eyes startlingly vivid. He was too beautiful to be anything other than a dream. She wanted to reach up and touch him, run her fingers across his narrow face. But that would make the dream vanish. And she didn't want that. Now why couldn't she find someone like him in real life? Without the pointed ears of course. She blinked and in that fraction of a second, the dream vanished and she was lying in front of the television, staring at the menu screen, disappointment washing over her. The opening music was on its short loop and she wasn't sure how she'd fallen asleep when she'd been determined to remain awake. A smile slowly formed. Not that she was complaining after having had a dream like that. 
She rolled to the side, expecting to find Jackson lying beside her. Her half-formed smile faded. She was alone, with only the many cushions from the couch scattered across the cream-colored carpet. Sitting up, she glanced around the lounge room. No one. She half reclined so she could get her phone from the pocket of her jeans. She checked the time. One in the afternoon. Her stomach grumbled, highlighting the fact she'd missed lunch and it had been hours since breakfast. Maybe that was what he was doing. He was probably hungry, too. It'd be just like him to make something for the two of them to eat. Stumbling to her feet, she smothered a yawn as she headed for the kitchen. Remaining in the doorway, she scanned the room. It was exactly the way she and her mum had left it after breakfast. Dishes in the draining rack, now dry, the curtain at the window over the sink was half drawn open, and the tablecloth remained on the round, four-seater table in the corner. Annoyance arrowed through her. Had he left without saying goodbye? That didn't seem like him at all. Taking out her phone again, she checked her messages. There were several from Marinda, a couple from other friends, but none from Jackson. Returning her phone to a pocket of her jeans, she searched the rest of the house, finishing up in the lounge room. Anger rushed in on her. He'd walked out on her while she'd been asleep. After all the worrying she'd done over sparing his feelings, he'd gone and done that to her. Taking out her phone, she sent him a message. I wouldn't have thought you'd be so rude as to leave without saying goodbye. We're finished. She slid her phone back into her pocket, pushing aside the guilt that tried to form now the initial rush of anger was fading. She tried to focus on something else rather than think about what she'd done. It wasn't like she was the one who'd walked out on him with no word. Thoughts of Marinda came to mind, but they only had her circling back to Jackson. Marinda would have to get over the breakup. Or date Jackson herself. Taking her phone out once more, she sent a message letting her best friend know her and Jackson were over, and she could date him if it was that big a problem. She grinned at the reply. As if. I'd never do that to you. I don't hate him. And it wouldn't bother me. He just bores me. She settled in at the kitchen table, sending messages back and forth to her friend, regularly smiling and a few times laughing aloud. She continued messaging Marinda as evening fell and she prepared dinner. Her mum was away for work this weekend. Some conference her boss had demanded she attend, even though she'd tried to get out of it. Elsie leaned her hip against the kitchen bench, a fork held above the rump steak sizzling in the pan as she waited to flip it. This was her last year of school and she had no idea what she was going to do once she finished. Whatever it was, she wasn't going to end up in some boring job like her mum, doing things she hated all the time. Being ordered around and stuck with the most tedious of jobs also her boss could keep the fun parts of the work for himself. After dinner, having planned to get her assignments finished this first weekend of the school holidays, she headed for her room. She'd barely stepped inside when her phone rang. Not recognizing the number, she almost let it go to her message bank. Hello? Elsie? This is Jackson's mum. Is he there? I'm guessing his phone is flat since all my calls go straight to his message bank. Hi Mrs. Bryant. He took off sometime after I fell asleep watching a movie. Without saying goodbye. There was a moment of silence before Mrs. Bryant spoke again. Are you certain? That doesn't sound like him. Elsie hesitated. Yes. When the silence stretched out she spoke again. Maybe. Do you know where he might have gone? I thought he went home. Are you certain? Elsie automatically nodded. Yes. If you hear from him can you tell him to call me? I'm worried. Sure. Thank you, Elsie. The line went dead and Elsie stared at her phone. Where had Jackson gone? She tried to think of all the possibilities. There were none. He might be sociable and like having campouts at the caravan, but he always let his mum know where he was going and when he'd be home. Always. A shiver ran down her spine and she tried not to think about what might have happened. 
His house was five streets away from hers. She'd thought the neighborhood was quiet. What if she was wrong? Slipping her phone into her pocket, she checked all the doors and windows were locked before she returned to her room. Focusing was difficult, and progress on her assignments was slow. She couldn't stop wondering what had happened to Jackson on his way home. Had a friend had an emergency and called him for help? It was the only explanation she could come up with. She again pushed aside the guilt, and instead tried to focus on her assignments. Jackson was still missing on Monday, and the police finally took it seriously. Elsie sat in the car beside her mum, who'd taken the morning off work to be with her while the police had interviewed her. She stared out the window, the car heater on full, trying not to think about all the questions that had been fired at her. She hadn't been able to tell them any more than she'd been able to tell Mrs. Bryant. She stared unseeing out the window. It seemed surreal. She rubbed her wrist where she'd once worn a gold bracelet with tiny diamond chips scattered across it, her hand slipping beneath the sleeve of her knitted jumper. The bracelet had been a gift on her 15th birthday from her great-aunt Elsie, the woman who'd delivered her when her mum had gone into labour early. She'd woken one morning, unable to find the bracelet, and great-aunt Elsie's words came back to haunt her. One day you'll lose something even more valuable if you don't take better care of your things. It had been the first and last expensive gift her great-aunt had given her. The last two birthdays she'd given her gift vouchers. She missed the unique gifts from her great-aunt. Although how expensive the bracelet had been, had made her uncomfortable. A shiver ran down her spine. Jackson had vanished as completely as the bracelet. She hoped that unlike the bracelet, he'd be found. Maybe you should stay with your father these holidays, Brenda said. Elsie half jumped at her mum's unexpected words. She finally looked away from the passing scenery. Didn't you say last week that I didn't have one? A smile fleetingly formed at the memory. That was when I was waiting for him to pay child support. He was late again. Elsie studied her mum, surprised at how tired and drawn she looked. Are you okay? Work is busy. My boss is cutting back on his hours so he can spend more time with his family, which means more responsibility for me. That'll be good, won't it? Brenda shrugged. We'll have to wait and see. I can't see it lasting long. She glanced over at Elsie. You never answered me about staying with your father. I didn't think it deserved an answer. Seriously, mum. Is not responsible enough to pay child support on time. Do you think he'd be responsible enough to look out for me? Lock all the doors and windows and don't go anywhere alone. Better yet, don't go anywhere at all. Mum. She drew the word out. I'm not about to sit in a locked house the entire holidays. She held up her hand when her mum started to speak. But I also have no plans to go anywhere alone. I'm not an idiot. Brenda sighed heavily. I know it's just. Her voice trailed off and she slowly shook her head. I can imagine this happening in Brisbane city centre, but not in our suburb. I would have thought it too close near a community for someone to have grabbed him off the streets. I can't believe not one single person saw him after he left our place. Elsie's gaze was drawn to the tree-edged roadside, some of the bare branches stretching out above them. She didn't bother mentioning that no one had actually seen him leave their house. Again, Great Aunt Elsie's words came to mind and a shiver ran down her spine. One day you'll lose something even more valuable if you don't take better care of your things. She closed her eyes, pushing thoughts of Jackson and the bracelet aside. It was impossible. The words kept repeating in her mind, accompanied by images she didn't want to see. No wonder she'd struggled to sleep properly the past two nights. Will you be okay if I go back to work?